All right. Um, let's jump into it and give us your background really quick. So I've been in the logistics industry for a little over 10 years. I've started a few businesses in this space, um, exited those in different ways. Uh, my most recent business was a tech enabled brokerage focused on applying NLP to the space. And today um, I work with uh, transportation companies and technology companies that serve uh, logistics and transportation on everything from technology to business practices. There you go. What is your favorite part about logistics? Uh, is nothing an option? Uh, that's, I think that's why you've dedicated the last 10 years to it. Right? Yeah. Well, because you need a job, right? Um, uh, I think my favorite part is how, um, far we have to go. And, um, like my current state favorite thing about logistics is how much momentum we have, um, be behind some of those things. Like there's just so much opportunity in technology. There's so much opportunity in, uh, you know, changing the operating model, et cetera. I mean, the business hasn't changed dramatically since deregulation, um, but over the last you know five years, there's been just a gathering storm of momentum in the space. And there's some companies, yours candidly is one of them, that are really rethinking and reshaping the future of the business, which is a lot of fun to to be a part of for sure. I think one of the things when you were looking at my notes that you saw is kind of who your who is your audience, and I know. You have a big voice in logistics. I think increasingly, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing more of, of you, Carrier Direct. There's all these, you know, kind of influencers popping up. But I, I'd be curious to, to, to hear you talk about, like, who consumes Ryan Triber, the, the influencer? Who do, you, who do you speak to? Because I think that's probably very different than, than who you sell to and who you think about, yeah. right? So, like, who... Now that you're 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 in the influencer space, like, yeah, how, like who who is who is the audience and, and what is that like? I think my answer of who to consume me is no one, or does consume me is no one. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I think you know ultimately your question is um, who who am I talking to, right? And and whether they whether they're actually whether I'm reaching them or not, like who am I trying to talk to, if right. you will? And I'm trying to talk to people like you, uh, people who are in position um, or striving to be in position to build the next um, iteration of what this industry is going to be, right? I mean, when I say like the industry has not fundamentally changed since deregulation, when we think about trucking companies and we think about intermediaries, uh, it really, really has not fundamentally changed. But there are folks who are starting to think and push that envelope um, that are in position to do that. You guys are absolutely one of those companies that's rethinking the operating model, the technology that's going to power that future state operating model of what managed transportation looks like, of what brokerage looks like. A company like Variant run by my friend Cameron Ramsdale is another one of those saying, how do we how do we redo the, the inside of the four walls of a trucking company um, in a way that's that's different than the way that it's been done for the last 30 something years. Um, and there's that opportunity that's so I think I'm, sp I'm speaking to those people who want to be curious enough to um, uh, just hear what I have to say and whether they agree with it or not. Um, it at least maybe is challenging the way that they're thinking about it right now um, in a way that can maybe get the gears uh, spinning a little bit. Yeah. One thing I'd be kind of curious to hear you talk about is like, there's a lot of issues in logistics, right? Like there's a lot of issues every single day. About there's it, nothing. Maybe. There you go. But I'm, yeah, um, but seriously folks. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes that level of noise, right. Affects people's, uh, ability to really look and think downrange. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Cause there's always 10,000 problems right in front of your face and you, you get a little bit consumed by the things right here. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I guess my question to you is, is as someone who, who, you know, clearly thinks about the future and has a, has a strong voice and an opinion about what the future of transportation looks like, like how, you know, maybe if you could kind of categorize like the different groups and not necessarily like brokers, right. But like there's, there's trucking companies, there's, there's shippers, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, there's logistics companies, there's technology companies in the space. Like if we zip 10, 15 years in the future, what does this model look like? What does this world look like as Ryan Triber organizes it? Oh my God. That's a really broad question. Um, uh, I don't know that it's possible to look that far in the future right now in a lot of respects. Um, one reason for that is the pace of change. Um, 
technology is evolving as a thing in and of itself. I mean, five years ago, mm -hmm. machine learning uh, was not capable of nearly some of the things that it was. It is now. Um, so from a data perspective, we're able to do uh, so much more. That that pace of change is going to continue and is really going to unlock things um, for folks. And I think liability, shifting liability is going to be a big um, driver of the future. So like uh, that applies to trucking companies, brokers, shippers. That also applies to things like autonomous vehicles that might really change and reshape our industry. Um, but I do think that um, as I look at it, um, trucking companies and intermediaries or transportation providers broadly, when we look domestically, will start to look a lot more like each other. Um, and I think that a lot of that's going to come from trucking companies starting to understand that they are a logistics platform and what they bring to the table is capacity. And that's what a, that's what a broker brings to the table as well. And reshaping that thought process of we are a logistics platform. We are not just trucks on the road yeah. um, is going to be a real green space opportunity for them. Um, liability, I think, will also help push folks together. Uh, one thing that I also think will change dramatically is our approach toward trailers um, and what I've called sort of historically BYOT, bring your own trailer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of latent capacity tied up in trailering, something I've been talking about for years. And now we're really seeing a lot of that come to, to a head with the trailer shortage, with the microchip shortage, et cetera. Um, so that's another thing that's going to really kind of accelerate that trend toward brokers and carriers looking a lot more like each other. What do you see? Because I know, like, are, are you kind of talking about like like Convoy has, has written a lot about this, right? Yeah. Like trailer pools and, and kind of shuffling freight across the country mm -hmm. versus traditional kind of long haul trucking? Or when you're talking about like rethinking how we talk about trailers, what does that well, mean? Well, what trucking looks like long haul versus short haul, a lot of that is going to depend on shifting globalization. Like there's been a lot of talk of deglobalization. Yeah. I've been I've been thinking about a little bit more of shifting globalization because we're not going to reshore all of this manufacturing. We may nearer shore it. We may differently shore it. We might bring more home. We right? might bring. We'll certainly bring some of it Especially home. Especially with the economics of importing. Things, Absolutely, right? Like right. twenty five thousand dollars. But we're not going to bring long. all of it home totally. the way yeah, we were. And shippers are definitely going to start thinking. You know, the COVID made them start thinking differently about. Um, de-risking the origin of their goods, things like what's going on with the Port of Long Beach ever given, although that isn't really affecting us here, are making them think differently about de-risking their trade lanes. That's going to fundamentally change the way that freight comes into this country. So long haul versus short haul, et cetera, there are certainly opportunities for us to control that, relays, et cetera. What I'm really talking about there, though, is, um, is, is, is particularly latent capacity. You know, when you think about it, if, a, if BYOT, bring your own trailer, uh, if you're in a market that has 10 drive-in shipments and 10 reefer shipments, but you have 20 drive-in uh, trucks mm -hmm. and zero reefer trucks, right? Yeah. You actually have a balance of power units. You right. have an imbalance of trailers. And, and um, you also have uh, a utilization problem as it relates to drivers somewhat broadly in the country. Um, an underutilization because of this imbalance, particularly as it relates to trailers. So the way we've solved that is by proliferating the drop trailer programs, right, right, the right. convoys, relay programs, et cetera. That has proven to be a problem. And, and, and as we've reached kind of this critical mass of, of trailering, that's going to need to roll back. And so I think what it looks like a lot more is programs or companies. It may be, I'm not exactly sure how it plays out. Shippers may Kind of like rehome their trailers if if this okay. is an extended if this is an extended uh, issue with getting uh, trailer capacity uh, for carriers etc. It might look like something like extra lease having a rider having programs for you know more sort of like opt in on a one way route for trailering and redistributing those. It might look for something like JB Hunt leveraging their rail capacity. I mean they can you know move their trailers around etc. And then opening those up to other uh, smaller carriers. But I just I think that the, particularly what I mean there is that really we're just going to look at a, um, unlocking latent capacity uh, from a, a human perspective, especially if uh, the liability related to autonomous vehicles sort of delays that adoption. Now you've just opened up a whole can of worms. Yeah, I mean, this is up. what it's like in my head all the time. So, you know. All right. Give me the give me the autonomous vehicles. What I mean, this is honestly something that 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 I get a lot. It just 
you know, not necessarily from cust, but just outside people, right? Yeah. You talk to people who work in different industries, and one of the first things they always ask about is is autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Uh, way more so than like electric vehicles. It seems like people like, uh, you know, they they like the idea of of no one driving a car much yeah. more than they like the idea of. of well, they don't like it. Engine. It scares them. They, right. Like right, 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 right. It's it's almost right. a it's almost like you know. It's almost like watching a horror movie kind of thing. They're very yeah. afraid of what the implications of that are for themselves, for their families, et cetera, um, almost nonsensically so, but yeah. And so when I get asked that, I kind of fall back on on some kind of like, it's gonna be a tough regulatory issue, right? Like Tesla hits someone on a sidewalk and kills mm -hmm. someone and, and that's in the front page of the New York Times for a week. Like the same thing's gonna happen with some of these autonomous vehicles and, and you know, are we are we societally going to be able to adopt that is kind yeah. of my big hesitation. On, well, those on are that, two different right? things, really. Right. Like whether regulators get involved and whether we're able to adopt it as a society. And I think that essentially right when the, the adopted as a society, uh, but there's essentially two paths forward regardless. Right. One is the path that we're actually currently on, which is uh, when you kind of break down the levels of autonomy, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm you see that a lot of this autonomous um, technology is making its way into our vehicles mm -hmm. slowly totally. in a way that kind it's of makes us not right? yeah, non-threatening yeah. and, and, and not, uh, not even think about the fact that like, you know, I, my, my, I just bought a car a couple months ago when we moved to Texas and you know, it has adaptive cruise control. It has like lane keep. Yeah. It has these things that essentially make it level three autonomous but they're just safety features when I think about that. And there are there are you know parts of a drive where I'm not really engaged in the driving of the vehicle. Yeah. Um, so that's one path forward. The other path forward is regulators have to come or do step in and make the decisions for everyone. And I think that what will, so then to your point about things being in the New York Times, what will really drive that is, um, is liability. I mean, I know I mentioned liability before, but liability really makes the world go round. If OEMs start becoming liable for the types of things they haven't been in the past, OEMs are really usually just liable for products liability. But if all of a sudden there's a there's a collision on the road, it gets in, you know somebody sues GM or Tesla, and they're held to a negligent standard for an algorithm they wrote or whatever it might be. It's a very different type of liability that might make them pump the brakes on things and ask regulators to get involved. Um, but I think uh, if we can stay on the path that we're on, I think that the path to autonomously driving vehicles is actually much faster, uh, broadly speaking. Now, getting into consumer versus commercial is a totally different story. How, I mean, and this is a little bit of a tough question, but just in terms of timelines and like the amount of change, right? Like when, when do you see, and if you do change in the AV space happen commercially, and then what, you know, to your point, that can either be like, you know, a percentage on the margin or it could be a wholesale shift in the way that we think about things, right? Like, I'm certainly hopeful that it's sooner rather than later. I mean, yeah. the, the truth is when I said I said kind of almost nonsense a moment ago, I mentioned, hey, folks are kind of afraid of this, maybe nonsensically. So the, the truth is, if we look at it logically from a, you know, from a logical decision sort of theory approach. Um, the algorithms are already better at driving than the average human, right? It's just it's it's a it's an undisputable like digi, you know a, a yeah. data based fact, right? Oh. Um, and so there's that emotional component to it. I, I think that so I'm certainly hopeful that it's sooner rather than later because the logic it, it it's it you know driving is an unbelievably dangerous activity, like the most dangerous. It thing is you can the do. single <laughs> most dangerous thing you can do every single day, yeah. and it's. Really, like any loss of life is a tragedy. Personally, I think that it's almost irresponsible of us, given where we are in the development of autonomous vehicles, that we let humans drive still anyway. But that's a that's a whole different podcast, probably. Yeah. I think that um, I think given where we are as a society today, it almost has to come from the um, from the uh, consumers consumer sector pushing into commercial. I mean, that's how what you've really seen drive preference in the commercial sector. It, you know, it's the Amazon effect that everybody kind of talks yeah, about. Um, the other, the other way again, also is going to be liability on its way in. I mean, these um, nuclear judgments, which hasn't really been something we've talked about over the last 12, 15 months, 
maybe in part because fewer people have been on the road during right. COVID, uh, but liability on these carriers, on brokers, and eventually on shippers, which honestly, that liability is the one that probably makes adoption um, that much uh, more imperative on the transportation providers uh, will be an, it would certainly would be another driving factor for adoption. I would say. What would you say? Uh, I mean, I think we if we go back to kind of talking about problems and and how this is a, a you know, and it's something we talk about here a lot, right? Like the the, the whole world in logistics and transportation is problems, and, mm-hmm. and the reason that people pay us is to solve the problems, right? So yep. if you're not a problem solver in here, then like we got to talk about it and figure right. out which problems that you're interested in, how you're going to solve them, right? right? Um, but, it, it, you know, if you were to think about how we move forward, right? Let's go back to that downrange, long-range um, 15 years from now. Do you think a- AV is the one thing that fundamentally changes? Or or another way to say that would be like, what do you think the – again, we're, we, you have a ton of power here. You have a brush and you're able to change things and build systems. Like what is the one thing – that is going to fundamentally change the industry. Is it AV or is it something else? I mean, I, I, I kind of reject the premise in a manner of speaking because I don't think anything is ever one thing, um, right? And so um, I do think AVs have the power to fundamentally change many things. Yep. Um, by themselves, they certainly won't change everything because, um, as I was mentioning earlier, interesting companies like the 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 inside the four walls of a trucking company inside the four walls of a brokerage that's still if that remains the same the power of autonomous vehicles are not going to be unlocked from an efficiency perspective et cetera and so forth there's things that need to change in those four walls as well i personally am very bullish on natural language processing i think conversational user interface is the future of um, user interfaces um, because I think that it's the it's the most natural way that we're used to interacting. Uh, so I think NLP has the power. And it's, it's, it's also one, by the way, that very few people are working on or focused on. So that it has the added sort of benefit of not being um, just just the, the other app that you have to what, download. What's the application of that in your Any, estimate? Um, I think the lowest hanging fruit uh, certainly is uh, things like um, bidding, uh, uh, like load bidding, negotiation, tracking, you know, requests for tracking updates. Some of the some of the tasks that really are just um, mindless, uh, at least in the early applications of them, and, and how how I've used them in my career previously, um, is is some of those applications that really are just the mindless tasks that you have to apply a human toward when you can't get compliance on the other side. I think the uh, certainly like. If a driver will download a tracking app or you can plug into an ELD and track them, that's a first best solution. Right. But you're requiring or you're betting on someone else changing their behavior. There's a ton of push on that though, right? Like mm-hmm. from a driver perspective. I mean, if you if you put yourself in their shoes a little bit and you think about they're working across shippers, they're working across brokers, they're trying to manage their day to day and everyone's coming to them with a system, right? Yeah, Use 100%. this system, use this system. And, and so- Personally, I feel like, you know, the natural instinct on that is to reject that in some way, right? Well, especially when there's, uh, you know, you're, there's two kind of factors that, that I think uh, folks lose. Uh, uh, the first one people don't lose sight of, which is there's just always been a l- huge lack of trust in this industry. Um, broker to carrier, driver to broker, driver to carrier, et cetera. I mean, just th- there, there's been too, um, it's been too opaque for too long for all the parties that there really is kind of that baked in. But the thing I think folks lose sight of when you think particularly about the problem of the, of the driver is uh, these folks are working in their home, right? And, like they're not work from home 100%. in the same way that I'm yeah, work from home yeah. right now, but they are working from their home. So when we ask a driver to put an inward facing camera in their cab, we're asking them to put an inward facing <laughs> camera in their living room. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, or even, yeah. even if, even though it's their workspace, imagine that, you know, I came to you and I said, Hey Steve, like we need to put a camera. We promise we'll only look at it if there's a problem, but we need to put it in your workspace so that we can look at you whenever we want. Right you would feel a certain kind of way about that. And that's true of all of these things. I don't want people to track. I don't want my wife to track me, you know, necessarily. I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be doing, but I don't want that. And so um, choice is definitely a big part of that uh, as well. Uh, Like giving folks back choice is a trend that I'm definitely tracking what we're tracking, particularly as it comes to tracking, Um, you know, building systems where you can give folks more choice, more power, but still get what you need um, as opposed to being prescriptive. So, yeah, I think you're right. There's a ton of solutions when it comes, or to, everybody's trying to give the drivers a solution. 
they're also not taking it from a design, you know, from a customer centric thought process. It's one of the things I like about what Redwood's recently done with their El Paso logistics platform as a service is it's really bringing that Silicon Valley like customer centric approach to designing solutions for transportation and logistics, which is something that's been lacking for a long time. Yeah, I, I mean, that's it. It, you know, I think one one kind of question that I had, and there's there's uh, you know theme of of what you kind of talked about is like treating driver. How do we treat drivers? How do mm-hmm. we interact with drivers? How do we um, incentivize drivers? How do we make them them whole and make and, mm-hmm. you know and, and build that trust, right? And I think it's something um, something you hear a lot about in in the transportation and logistics space is treating drivers more focused on mm-hmm. driver. I mean, everyone says it, right? Like, and I I heard everyone says it. Yeah. It, well, and I, I, you know, I was listening, um, it, you know, to someone that, you know, very well, uh, Noam was talking to Tim Dooner recently yep. on, on his show. And, and I mean, I think it was similar to the conversation that you had on, on your show with Noam, right? Mm-hmm. He, he goes through all of that, but you know, it, he's talking about, you know, the, the way that they changed the industry. And one of the things was paying drivers. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. so, you know, kind of the way that, that this conversation goes is, is we say, we're going to treat drivers well, okay, what does that mean? We're going to, we're going to pay them on time. Right. And, and, and we're going to communicate with them, build relationships with them and try to build trust with these people and, and you know, do what we say we're going to do. Right. right? And on, on some level, uh, that's not really treating drivers well. That's that's like being a human being. So that's actually business. what I was going to go with exactly it's what you're like, saying. If we zoom up, I think actually the, the overarching point is treat people like people. Right. And we spend a lot of time talking about the technology that might be in the space or that might come to the space or, or how technology might affect the space. Um, but technology and, 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 so, and so one of the concepts in there also is that technology and humans aren't at odds. Like they, they are not each other's enemy. And a lot of times that's the approach that most folks take toward technology is that it will take my job. It is not my mm-hmm. friend. Uh, and 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 that's just, just patently untrue. But at the end of the day, um, humans are still humans and humans will still be a part of the process for a very long time. Uh, and, and the question is, what will they be doing? Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, like absolutely, what it comes down to is the winners will be the ones who treat people like people. The shippers that treat people like people, the brokers, the carriers, the drivers, all of the folks that treat people like people, that's the key, right? right. Absolutely. And so I guess my question to you as I was thinking about it is like, what is the next generation of that, right? Like we, on some level, we we both agree, right? So carry, you know, again, it goes, carriers are important. We're going to be honest to them. We're not going to deceive mm-hmm. them and we're going to pay them for their services. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's that seems fair. What, especially, you know, whether it's technology, what, you know, I guess what are and how do we think and how how should we think about um, how to really differentiate in, in terms of the, you know, the way that we interact with drivers, right? Like what is, if that's a, if that's the base level, what is the, what is the best, right? Well, best in class. Yeah, the best in class, it's, it's funny. And this is actually probably in a lot of ways going to seem very simple, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that's often not done, which is um, meeting them where they are. Like how, and this is why I'm bullish on NLP. It's why, uh, uh, why, you know, sort of the giving them the power of tracking, Whatever it, it 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 really it taking that customer centric approach, we need to meet folks where they are, and that's the next phase of what we're. It's not just being nice and sending them cards and posting on social media about how much we appro- right. appreciate yeah. drivers. Yeah. It is actually taking that next step of meeting folks where they are, and that means everything from it means really building an environment where they can transact business how they want to. Everyone can transact business how they want to. A shipper can transact business how they want to. A carrier, a broker, um, a driver, et cetera, right? So do I want to do that through an app? Do I want to do that through chat? Do I want to do that on the phone with you um, to, to execute a transaction? Um, but it it, it, it it all the way through to how am I compensating a driver and a carrier, right? Uh, if I'm an intermediary, which obviously it, we are, so that's what we're talking about. And sorry about that. Uh, uh, how do I compensate them? What is total compensation, you know, to take an HR term and apply it to freight? What's total carrier compensation? What's total driver compensation? Why are they working with me outside of the transaction of that shipment? Right. And outside of the relationship, which is really in this industry just means in a transaction you do for me and I do for you. And maybe we talk about the bucks every so often, right? Right, right, right. It's it what what are some of those other things that we can do for each other 
to meet each other where they are so that I, because what Noam talked about was we solved problems for them. Their problems were cash flow. Right. We helped them solve that problem this way. Right. And so there's myriad examples of that when you look across the life cycle of a of a of acquisition of that client, which a carrier is also a client and a shipper is a client, and and also the execution of the transaction. Every yeah. single one of those is an opportunity. Totally. It just I guess it, it kind of struck me listening to it that they're talking about innovation in 1980. For, and it feels like that's still, and I guess that's probably true for logistics and a lot of different things, well, what right? Did I start like, off by saying, like, it, it hasn't fundamentally changed in thirty years, right? Like, it, what's different? Like, where's the where's the innovation? Where's the change? How are we doing this better? And it just it, it feels like a lot of the same things that you know he's talked about, and I've heard him talk about are are you know are, are still very much true today. 100%. So I, I think. That's where, you know, that's where Carrier Direct is helpful. You know, shameless plug. Um, well, you shamelessly plug it, so I'm fine with it. I yeah, didn't shamelessly yeah, yeah. plug it. No, yeah. I was giving you the credit. Um, but I, I, th I think collectively, how, you know, as a group, right, as consultants, as operators, as logistics companies, it's like how, as trucking companies, yeah. right? How do, we, how do we evolve that? Because it doesn't, you know, again, on, on like the scale of hierarchy of needs, it seems like we, you know, we've all accepted that we can meet the basic check yeah. mark, right? But how do we, you know, it seems like the folks that would, that are going to win in the long term are going to have some creative thoughts about how we do that. Well, right? the interest, like it, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think ultimately my, my stance on this is, uh, you don't need to shoot for a big transformational one shot change. There are so many things we can do differently, and this may not be as sexy of an answer, yeah. right? But you can piece together so many of these different things if you think about each one of them differently that builds up to a transformational change. So how, like, just instead of saying, I want to reimagine the entire broker carrier chipper experience, or I want to try, okay, how do we just reimagine the tracking experience? How does that, let's take that workflow by itself and reimagine that from a zero based perspective, right? First principles. Right. How do we do that for every single thing that we do, every single way we engage with folks? How do we reimagine each one of those things and, and, ta and, and take them on instead of saying, what's the next TMS? What's the next Uber freight? Yeah. What's the next, you know, uh, uh, JB Hunt's rail opportunities or what have you? Like, let's take each one of these use cases and reimagine them and re-piece them together. Because some of it is just changing the way that we, that's why I love NLP. What's really transformational is we can just change the way we engage with each other. And I'm not asking, I don't have to ask you to change. You right. can keep doing everything that you're doing, but your experience is going to improve because I'm going to be better at engaging with you. I'm going to have more bandwidth to engage with you, et cetera. So I think that um, it's it it's still very interesting and creative, but it doesn't necessarily require you to have this lightning stroke of genius. It's a process you can work to actually be innovative and disruptive. Yeah, no, I think that that makes. I mean, it makes sense. So it's it's you know how how do we rethink every interaction point right mm -hmm. like and how do we yeah, I, I i like the way i like the way that you thought about that um i, I guess that's why I'm, you invited me here today yeah because <laughs> i wanted to wanted to think yeah yeah exactly <laughs> one one thing um you know i i feel like in the public sphere conversations about transportation and logistics there's a lot of airtime um that's taken up talking about what manufacturers, retailers, distributors want, right? Mm -hmm. And where we tend, where that conversation tends to happen and what it tends to talk about is driven by Amazon, by Walmart, mm -hmm. by Lowe's, by Home Depot, by- you know, ABN Benefit. Yeah. Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not our, focus and that's not our base mm -hmm. uh, i guess so from for my question to you would be as someone who's who's worked in a bunch of different brokerage presumably has worked with large companies small companies mm -hmm. startups in startups right and you've seen the the variances um what what i think we've seen is that the conversations that happen in the public sphere and what Amazon wants and what Walmart wants isn't necessarily what the startup wants and mm -hmm. needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if, as you think about, if you could speak to 
um, you know, shippers, manufacturers, distributors, retailers who maybe are, are large, complex businesses, right? We're talking about businesses that are sometimes doing $300 million a year in sales, mm-hmm. but they just have a totally different use case and, and perspective and way to operate and think about transportation and logistics. Like if you could kind of talk to those guys, right? Where it's, uh, I guess, what would you, what would you say and how, how, how do companies interact and think about, um, you know, working with those, those smaller types of companies, sure. right? Because I, I think it's just very, very different than the way that you interact with Amazon. It is, uh, it is, it is, and it isn't. I think that the one thing that I would say to, to those companies, um, that is kind of the same, uh, from a best practice perspective, it's the same thing that I would say to, um, to transportation providers in engaging with them is the future is flexible. Right. I mean, that's something that we saw. Uh, that's something that we saw in dealing with COVID, in going home, in returning to work, and some people can't go home. In how the supply chain disruptions affected everything, it's shifting consumer preferences, accelerating to uh, you know ecom, et cetera, and so forth. The 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 truth is the future is flexible, and being adaptive is what's going to be more important in the future than it maybe has been in the past. And so I think when you think about that from a shipper perspective, you know, serving the needs of your customers, you also need to be flexible. And so how are you how are you uh, organizing your business from a um, you know we talked about deglobalization a little bit ago or differently globalization a bit ago. So how are you organizing your supply chains to be flexible and differently global if, if necessary, right? Mm-hmm. And how are you distributing your product? Where are you warehousing them? Where are you how are you moving them? How does your supply chain work from a just in time perspective? Because the the history sort of especially in the last 20 or so years around just in time supply chains, um, as an example, uh, is really just been about shifting burdens. Oh, I'm going to make this the intermediary's problem. I'm going to make this the carrier's problem, right? Just in time hasn't really meant, you know, it gets manufactured and it gets to me. It means the inventory just gets held a little further upstream yeah. so that the vendor can meet my just in time requirements. And right. so, how do we reimagine? Like, again, it's an opportunity to say, like, I know that I'm going to need to be more flexible and more nimble in the future so that I can meet my clients' demands or if something happens. Like, look, like I don't think COVID's happening again. Let's hope. Like, nothing like that happens, right? I mean, I don't think that the ever given is happening again, even though that hasn't really affected us here domestically. I don't, I don't you know, Port of Long Beach eventually will hypothetically get sorted out or we'll start rerouting containers, something like that. But the, the truth is things will continue to change. And so – the rigidity is what catches companies up. And so I would say to, sh- to, to middle market manufacturers that, you know, the large manufacturers uh, or retailers or whatever it might be, what you should take from them and think about is how do I, how am I more flexible? How do I help my vendors be more flexible in servicing my needs as opposed to being as prescriptive as we've been in the past? Totally. And I think the one thing that I would add to that is like how same audience, same message, but how how does technology support that, right? That level of flexibility. Because I mean, technology I, is everything. In right. That, for and sure. and I, I think what we've seen on some level is, is um, a fear of it, maybe in the same way that, that you know, folks are afraid of, of AV. Like, you know, they just don't have the resources, right? So when people are resource constrained, they, they fall back in on themselves or the way that they've already done it, right? Because we don't, you know, we're not Amazon. We don't have an army of, of you know, mm-hmm. a million developers who are the highest paid, you know, most badass kick-ass developers in the world. So we're going to continue to operate in the way right. that we always have because we're a, you know, a food manufacturing company or a metals manufacturing company, whatever we are, right? So, you know, I, I, I manufacture metal though. No, no, I'm you, just kidding. <laughs> you heat it it's up. Like a natural, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like a naturally occurring thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I know exactly what you mean. You know, Eric Johnson of JOC recently wrote a, um, wrote a piece that, that touched on this that he asked me for, for some quotes for. And, um, and uh, it just so happened to come along at the same time as Redwood was talking about this L pass and, and, and similar to uh, just along some of the times the conversations you and I have had about how you guys have organized your business and why that's attractive from that respect. And, um, you know, my point in many of those cases was to your point around fear. The problem is um, the it's, it seems like a lot of work. Because, yeah. because the tech stacks, particularly for shippers, are really complicated. 
Um, and what's what's attractive about the approach that some companies are taking, like your like like Redwood, is de-risking that for shippers, right? And, and so, because the reality is that for any of this to actually work better, for for us to get to a place where we're not just incremental improvement on the margins, right? Because at the end of the day, it's still a, it is definitely a cost play. Like you, you you'll pay a premium yeah. for service, but I can't pay a two x premium for service. Right. So we on the transportation presider side are, are, need to get better, and shippers need to get better on that sense. Right now, we're in incremental improvement space. For that to change, we need technology to enable that. We need to be able to meet people where they are more. Right. And one of the when meeting people where they are in this context means not just dumping a bunch of data on them. And saying again, shift the burden. You figure out how to deal with it. Right. Uh, it's it's building tools and in, and doing integrations in a way that allows people to safely share that burden. It's what I call assistance with decisioning. Help other folks understand, yeah. like guide them through that process to let them make the best decision possible. And I think that's that's a big piece of that for sure. Uh, when you think about the uh, manufacturer or shipper uh, space. Yeah, totally. I mean, you mentioned, um, kind of talked about the market and we talked about COVID kind of anecdotally, right? It's the backdrop of everything. But I know uh, just on the conversations that we have all the time, market is is the forefront, especially cost and the dynamics, mm-hmm. right? Like, I'm going to ask you the, the million dollar question, when and, and how do you see the market changing? from where it is now, right? We we kind of went into COVID, every, the whole world shut down, yeah. everything kind of dropped. And then from last summer on, we've been kind of on this, on this, you know, escalating path towards higher rates, less capacity. Um, and I think, you know, in, in everything that we do, we're, we're starting to feel that on some level, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, it's, it's being talked about and has been talked about in the wall street journal, you know, it's yeah. the New York times. We're seeing Craig know, Fuller's people, on Bloomberg. My right, father-in-law is texting right. me about Craig Fuller on right, Bloomberg. Right, totally, about it, totally. for sure. and, and people are justifi- justifying price increases based on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, CNBC is talking and, and, you know, the the White House is now talking and looking at the railroads and they're looking at, yeah. you know, the, the container lines in, in term in a regulatory lens. So, you know, how I guess kind of two part question. One, when ish do you see this loosening up? And then two is, you know, what are two or three things that we should all have our ears perked up on that sure. we once we hear, you know, the rabbit ears should be going up a little bit that that maybe the environment and the dynamics are starting yeah. to change. Um, the one thing that everybody should listen to is probably my friend Chris Pickett, who's formerly of Coyote um, and uh, uh, now is with a company called Flock Freight and has Pickett Research. Chris thinks that uh, you know that Q4 this year is where we'll see the inflection point. I, I he is much smarter about this stuff than I am in a lot of respects, um, uh, and and so I, I can follow his lead there a little bit. But I think that there are a number of weighting factors that suggest that this could also persist for a while. Again, that I that concept of shifting global, you know, shifting globalization, you know, carriers have gotten pretty good at large carriers have gotten pretty good at balancing their network, um, you know, seasonally, annually, what have you, such that, you know, that uh, for inbound port freight, et cetera. Um, if that starts to change dramatically, it's going to be difficult for those carriers to uh, to adjust. Um, and, and that that'll definitely disrupt the amount of freight that's available in the the spot market. But I think that the interesting thing there is, again, sort of thinking about that concept of the future being flexible. Um, And the opportunity space within that, again, kind of these looking at these little areas of improvement that are going to build up to a disruptive change. How do we as a, as a, as transportation providers, how do we think differently about lowering our costs to serve, right? Mm-hmm. So that we can pay more when we need to, charge less when we need to, and be able to ri- cut down the risk factor on this pendulum swings for our clients and for ourselves. Um, I get off, asked, often asked, do I need to do I need to be prepared to promote uh, pr- uh, to compete in a low margin future? And I say, I don't know, but you should do it anyway, right? Because either you'll yeah. Either you have to and right. you'll survive or you don't have to. And you're more profitable. And you're either more profitable or you can charge less money and buy market share or whatever right. it is. Exactly. Right. Right. So yeah. I think that that that's kind of when I think about when the market's going to change, no one knows we don't have a crystal ball. But those are the things that we can control that are within our purview to control that we should focus on instead of trying to figure out when the goose that laid the golden egg is going to die. 
right? Yeah. And now's the time to invest in those things. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that, that would really exhaust my questions. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? When you think about the future of your business and like where you guys um, are growing and how you, the, like the work that you've done, particularly on capacity strategy, mm-hmm. which, um, which you and I spend a lot of time talking about, um, how do you think that particularly as an intermediary, intermediary and particularly as intermediaries engage with carriers and drivers, where do you see that big number one opportunity space from a, from a strategy perspective? It's a really good question. Um, I, I, I guess, uh, and this probably isn't the best answer, but on some on some level, I don't, which is why I was asking about it, right? Like, I don't see that big, innovative next thing. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I, you know, going in the meet folks where they are mindset, I think it's it's kind of our job to provide flexibility in the way that we work with people. So that's, you know, that is mm-hmm. that is where I see us increasingly moving towards, right, is, is trying to build strategic relationships. Um, again, it seems like it, it it's very much relationship driven, right? So, and we're, I mean, as you know, we're fairly new in this business. So you're, you're asking a noob, like, how, you know, what, what's going on? But that's on, what's attractive right? about it, right? Is that you have, you come at it with both fresh eyes and seasoned eyes, right? Like you understand how trucking works. You understand how logistics works. You understand how freight works. Right. But you're newer to the brokerage space, right? Because, mm-hmm. right. And totally. that, so that's what's attractive about your perspective on it because I'm a dyed in the wool trucking logistics guy, right? right? And so like right, right. as creative as I can, as I am or can be. Still have the 10 years of background, right? And as much as I can keep my bias top of mind, like that's what that's what makes it attractive to ask you the question exactly that reason. I mean, I guess I think it's about top down partnership, right? Like on both sides. Um, one thing that I think is a little bit of a miss from from our perspective and from other is the lack of strategic conversations, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the backdrop that that always I seem to run in as I think about trucking and how we interact with trucking companies is is obviously the fragmentation, right? Mm-hmm. Like in who who the folks are and especially in our space with our customer base in the volumes that they have, right? Like who who we can go to the well to consistently work with, right? Mm-hmm. And I think on some level, you know, how from, you know, from me all all the way down, how do we make ourselves accessible and attractive like that's how we win right and mm-hmm. i think you know like anything else um you know there's a there's a strategic process to that right there's a level of technology to that and, and there's people so how do we how do we get great people how do we train them in the right way mm-hmm. and how do we keep them thinking about the right things and building the right process and i think that's kind of the lens that we try to look at every single corner and in, in inch of our business um but as we, you know, what I see as we look at trucking companies is that we're we're not having the right conversations, right? Yeah. Like we, and we do this uh, in a bunch, this is another kind of way that we think about whether it's, you know, sales and marketing or whether, you know, it's account management or it's trucking is we almost think about things on a, on a sphere where down low there's these transactional, uh, you know, interactions, right? And you can apply this really to anything, but down here you're transactional and up here you're strategic. And mm-hmm. I think- when I look at it, we lose a lot of opportunities by uh, allowing ourselves and, and playing, you know, playing the game at a transactional level, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think that starts, and so that's why it's top down, right? Because it, it, every single person in our in our organization should be strategic about the way that they interact with every single external partner, whether mm-hmm. that's a, a, a vendor, whether that's a carrier, whether mm-hmm. that's a customer, right? And, and so I think the big question is how do we use really good people? How do we use adaptable technology? Uh, and, and how do we build the process so that we can, you know, kind of live in the strategic um, space more more than we do, right? Mm-hmm. Well, to your point, like there's only so much of that you can control, right? Yeah. I mean, like, you, they're they're absolutely that's a that's a change in mentality that needs to happen over time, and you need to hire people who are capable of 
of of breaking having that, right and, and have but and have like you have to have patience yep. you have to hire people who will have patience you have to hire people who will work through those problems totally and not fall back into bad habits or 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 that or what other people have done totally. in the past what, yep. you know what folks train us to do right yes in some ways uh maybe bad habits train carriers right. and then carriers train us we 100%. can't we, we can't allow that that was one of the happen. first conversations we had about capacity is i was you know you're like well i want to do this and i was like well here are some of the problems that you're going to run into getting exactly that accomplished, right? Like it's the right go to market with carriers in an objective sense. And so then the only question is, I think what most people struggle with that you guys don't, which is why I love your business. And I tell you, I'm obsessed with your business all the time, right? Is most people say, well, here's the problems we have today. Here's the ideal state. We can't get there. You guys think about, okay, well actually, so what are all the problems that we have to solve along the way? And you lay that out nicely. Technology is a part of that. People are a part of that. Training is a part of that. Patience is a part of that. Yep. Right. And then just continuing to engage people in that conversation at them at the strategic level mm -hmm. and then finding champions at the desk level as well who can internally help, you know, change the tide of some of those those things. But at the end of the day, you also still have to deliver for your customers in the now. So mm -hmm. balancing mm -hmm. those things is obviously really important. And I think you guys do a good job of that. Well, and, and it, you know, as you're talking, one thing I'm thinking about too is, is like measurement, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how what is, you have to define success to know whether you totally. succeeded or failed. And, and, or, and to, if you tried, right. If right. you even tried in the first place. Totally. And that, I think that's one thing, um, you know, part of being a, a problem solving company, right. And part of living in an industry where there are a lot of problems and, you know, we've always encouraged our, our team. And I think this is a big part of, of, you know, kind of why we've won is that there's things are always going to go wrong. Like mm -hmm. that, that's okay. Yeah. Right. It, but really it's about that continued progression, right? Mm -hmm. Like every, it, you know, it's so cliche, but it's, it's so true. Like every single day, are we getting 1% better? You know, are we just getting, yeah. are we, are we going in the right way or are we still having the same conversations and same problems that we were having six months ago? And as long as the conversations are changing, um, it, and we can look back and measure that progress, it, as long as we're going in the right direction, yeah. the business is healthy. Well, you have, you also, you have to have a process that relates to getting better. Like you have to have that continual improvement process to your point about like, there are problems, you know, it's not enough to have solved that problem and then just moved on. Like, okay, let we need to post mortem that problem. Right. What happened? What did we know? What could we have known? Right. Right. What couldn't we have known that we knew in the future? How do we find out that information? And to the extent that we can't, how do we control for that risk now that we know it exists? Right. right. And so that, but that requires an intentional effort and focus. Again, don't get distracted from delivering for your customers today. And in this context, your customer means both shippers and drivers, totally, right? And carriers. Totally. But then, okay, how, once we got through it, don't forget that it happened. That's And have the patience and the insight to do that post-mortem and, and work a continuous improvement process to try and avoid it in the future. At the same time, to your point about thing, you know, there will always be problems, you can't over-create process. You can't over-create no. rules for that thing that just, I remember when we started this company, Freight AI, the CTO didn't know Freight and Logistics. And I said, listen, I said, let me give you an example of how this is going to work. I said, at some point, we're going to have a problem where driver's got a load under his under, under him and, and he's driving down a rural road. And there's a there's going to deer is going to jet out, jump out into the highway <laughs> and the guy's going to hit the deer. And the guy's going to go, oh shit. And he's going to get out of the truck <laughs> and he's going to go check out the deer. A bunch of the deer's deer friends are going to come out of the woods with AK-47s. They're going to hold the driver up. That deer was faking it. It was actually just like a cardboard <laughs> deer. They're going to steal his cargo and they're going to run off with yeah. it. Yeah, it turns out the deer is in the mafia. I mean, hundred yeah, percent. <laughs> this is what I'm saying is going to happen to you at some point. We can't automate that away, right? That's why people right, are going to be right, involved right. in this for the longest time. <laughs> right. I, that was actually literally the example that I gave him. And that's what we're talking So. You know, let's say that happened to you guys, you know, right? I'm not saying it has. I'm just saying maybe if it did, you know, you can't create a bunch of process that says guys can't drive down a road where there might be deer, right? right I mean, it right, just right. makes sense yeah, because um, you can't control for every risk. But, you know, anyway, that's that's I think exactly what you're saying, uh, you know, as to your point of kind of like finding those lines and balancing those things out and being intentional about doing it. I think this is what makes a lot of sense. I have one more question. Okay. This is my last question. And it's because I looked at Kyle. Kyle you apparently on the internet have been talking a lot about work from home. 
about flexibility in it sounds like at least Kyle's a, consuming in my defense, Kyle's I say consuming a lot, of a lot of work from home content. Okay. Can you talk about I guess I'd be interested to hear you talk about the future of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, cuz it is an interesting dynamic, right? Like to your point earlier, we work with drivers every day and, and a large portion of their time is spent in a truck, right? And and so they're moving all over the place. So how in the logistics space, how should we think, uh-oh, he's doing a time check. So uh, maybe that means that he's going to go off for an hour on, <laughs> on working from home. <laughs> um, uh, no, my wife's friend who's staying in my house right now just texted me to say that the house alarm go off, went off, but like, don't worry if the cops call, everything's fine, which definitely means that she's a healthy gunpoint. She said the boys are safe though, which are the cats, so they're fine. Um, you know, so it stops there and it picks up right here. I think what my friend Mitch is trying to say here is that love is blind. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of my best friends' name is Mitch and, uh, uh, and he was obviously one of my, jokes. he's obviously one of my groomsmen. <laughs> and so when I got married, my, one of my, I, they said I had four groomsmen. I grew up with these two guys who are my best friends. One of them is Mitch and then my dad was my best man. So gets up and give a speech, you know, they, they played it off. They did the whole, like when my friend Mitch here trying to say thing. So, um, look, I think it's this, so work from home, I think is the same as any other problem that you're trying to solve. Like, why do people need to be anywhere? Why do people need to be in the U.S.? Why do people need to be, uh, in the office? Why do people need to, why why does it need to be people, right? Like that's kind of the point about NLP or technology. Like let's deconstruct this whole thing because if it's a bad reason, that you have people doing what you have them doing, stop doing it, right? And so work from home is a great example of this. If you need somebody to be in the office to, because your process is broken, because they need to be able to go, hey, what's going on with that thing? Mm -hmm. You have bad process, you have bad technology, you have bad uh, like training, all kinds of things. And by the way, your business is at risk for it because if that's what you're relying on, there's way too much institutional knowledge tied up in the individuals in your business. And that is a risk for you as somebody who's running a business or running a business unit or running a team. If you need them to be in the office because you need to, and this is probably what Kyle was referencing, um, because like you need to know, you, you need to, to know, uh, they need them to be there to know if they're doing their job. You are either ineffective as a manager, like, yeah. and you need to learn how to be a better manager, um, or uh, your technology is broken. Your, you know, uh, uh, your data is is poor in terms of that stuff. You need to hire better. You need to train better. The answer is not force everyone in the office. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it's putting you at a competitive disadvantage. If you are single sourcing your talent, right? Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and, and in that context, it means sourcing from only the geographies in which you have an office. Mm-hmm. Um, or, and, or uh, it means uh, sourcing talent that is available to come into your office and is willing to come into your office. You are constricting your 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 talent pool. And it's just like constricting any other pool. It's constricting your capacity pool. And there are good reasons to constrict to c- constrict your access to any type of capacity. You know, do you want to hire people who um, are murderers? Probably not. Like, if, especially if they're like current murderers. Maybe if like, you know, yeah, they're they reformed be, or something. Right, like yeah. everybody deserves a second chance. But totally. if they are like actively murdering right now, you probably don't want to hire that person. But um, similarly, like you don't want to hire a carrier that you know just stole a load or or is you know or has you know is is operating fraudulently. Um, but otherwise, you're constricting your capacity for you're, you're restricting yeah, your capacity. access to talent, ca- for, talent for no capacity. good reason, right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's putting you at a competitive disadvantage because there are good people that are available everywhere. I'll give you, and I mean. Like, I like to think that I'm a good, talented human. And my wife wanted to move away from Chicago. Our company was based in Chicago. And, you know, I had to have a conversation that said, listen, I'm leaving Chicago. So if you're telling me the only way that I can work here is that if I stay in Chicago, I'm going to have to leave. And, you know, that was conversations we had even before COVID. Um, But then that forced our business to reimagine it. And, And the reality is, like, there is... There are very few reasons, roles, opportunities within a business that can't be made remote. Now, there are going to be challenges for most businesses to make those roles remote, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't 
solve those problems and give yourself access to the best talent, the best locations to solve the problems domestically, internationally, work in an office, work from home, et cetera, because the future is flexible to give you a competitive advantage. So as someone who's passionate about this and- it, I'm and, passionate about lots of things. So, yeah, yeah, totally. A lot of passion. Um, you know, and in a business that that has clearly thought about it, I, I mean, how do you think companies will effectively balance uh, things like culture, and I know like inter, you know, personal connections are a big part of working a in a business, part, right? Yeah. And I think you know what we heard, we onboarded a ton of people during the yeah. pandemic, and there was a ton of challenges to that, right? Like the onboarding, um, I, I see is a little bit of a risk. Um, I think the the cohesion, right, that level mm -hmm. of of isolation that that people have said that they totally. feel, you know, from working from home, right? Like even the the guardrails of it. I, I mean, uh, and then I think the, the the culture, right? People are are inherently relationship builders, and they yeah yeah. So how I guess agree on everything that you said, right? But how how do you think again? How do you, how do the best companies going to approach it? And how how do you think about maintaining things like? Uh, you know, culture and social interaction. Yeah, and, totally. Well, like, let's tackle what culture isn't first. Like, culture isn't pizza parties. Like, it's not a papa shot. It's not like ping pong tables. Those things are cool and great and what have you. Like, but they're not culture. Right. You know, culture is obviously an intangible thing. And so, like, for starters, um, having a remote first workforce is a cultural thing in and of itself, right? And so, 100%. it it in and of itself by making that choice as a business, tells your employees that you are invested in them as individuals, that you trust them, right? That you want what's best for them, that you want what's best for this company and you're willing to, uh, like you're willing to be creative in that, in that solutioning. And that by itself, that decision creates a newer environment for you. I think what we are actually talking about is engagement more than you're talking about culture because culture happens organically and it's intangible factors that come from the decisions that you make as a business, right? Yeah, how you compensate people, how you, how you train them are some of the biggest drivers of culture that people don't talk about or think about. Well, and my only pushback to that would be, I think part of culture is built when you have leaders who buy into the, right? Like it's yeah. the mimicking aspect. So mm -hmm. if we have folks that... Uh, think about things a certain way, solve problems a certain way, communicate a certain way, uh, interact a certain way, right? Like to me, when I'm talking about culture, it's less about like going to happy hour, right? It's more about um, there's a certain way that folks who are going to be part of this environment are going to behave, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a mimicking aspect that when people enter or an organization, they're going to look at the people who are leaders, whether they're, mm -hmm. you know, have leadership titles or they're just leaders within the business, right? And we're going to, we're going to mimic that. Yep. And I think that, I also think that helps build the connective tissue, right? Yep. Like I look up to you. I admire you. I think you're smart. I think you do good work. I, I'm impressed when you I've never interact with to me, but I, I can yeah. kind of wrap my head around what all you the mean. people who say it like behind your back, right? right. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. like just the they say other things behind my back, also <laughs> not that, because I do hear about those things. Right. Absolutely, Steve. I mean, I think, look, number one, um, key, the key is hiring and training. Like you can, yeah. you can, you like people will can and will mimic you whether you're sitting in the office with them or not. Like people will get to know you whether you're sitting in the office with them or not, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so you, you know, the companies that'll win are, are, are and the companies that are winning are ones that get really good at vetting people, right? They get, and, and that's hard. Like it, hiring is really, right. really hard, which is exactly why you should consider a remote because again, because it opens you up to a talent pool. But th those things are not dependent on people being in the office. They're dependent on all the other things that you do, which is my point. It, they're all, all of those things are dependent on how you hire, how you train, what that experience is like, the recruiting experience, the onboarding mm -hmm. experience, the training mm -hmm. experience, how you build teams, how you expect teams to interact with each other, right? How you, build process, how you build compensation, how you do all of those things, and then layer on top of it some of the, the feel good stuff, right? Uh, and there's lots of, there are lots of, 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 of tactics and strategies around that. But the best cultures are ones that come organically from those other things coming together and particularly hiring the right type of folks. Yeah. My friend Joe Lynch says hiring right, like right thinking guys, is the term that he uses. And 
Now that, you know, to me doesn't mean hire everyone who thinks exactly the same, but it means hiring people who have certain values that that, that are right. ones that we want to reinforce throughout our organization. Well, and I think what, if I were to maybe summarize, and I think what I'm hearing you say is be intentional about it. I mean, intentionality is like probably that, you know, if this was Pee Wee's Playhouse, like everybody would scream every time have I say it. Have a plan. Know? Being, you know, have a plan. Absolutely. Focus on it. And, and but and it's also, and, you know, Steve, it's also focus on the right thing because, yeah. you know, focusing on culture is good and important and like real, like yeah. absolutely. But focus on how to impact it and how to impact it isn't people seeing you come in at six and leave at six or whatever it might yeah. be. What impacts it again is 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 training, is development, is uh, 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 is is, um, is 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 uh, primarily hiring, show, right? hiring, showing you know, uh, investing in technology, investing in uh, I mean, investing in training is, is probably the big one, and compensation right. programs, etc. Like creating forums for people to to share information and ideas, build people up, etc. It you know. It, and when I say that like the best cultures come up organically, like even those informal, you know, feel good culture things, we, we hired a woman recently who is a uh, project manager and uh, she is not in an HR function. But one of the first things she did was set up a holiday gift exchange. You know, we've had a couple of people have babies recently. She's set up baby sh- like virtual baby showers for them. She took that on. No one asked her to. Right. right? And it's been incredibly additive to our culture because it's not prescriptive it, it, it's not manufactured right it wasn't hr coming in and doing it it was an organic experience right. and that's the stuff you can't manufacture and so when you do all of those other things right when you hire great people like this woman caroline who's on our team that's where those things come from and happen they don't come from hr they don't come from you or me right well, they, and i think that's the mimicking too right because because once you see caroline who steps up and what she's doing is is being a leader, right? She's being 100%. she's being someone who cares about her coworkers and demonstrating that in very small but tangible ways, yeah. right? But she's being a leader, and then I think, in in, then someone sees that and they say, "Wow, Caroline, that was really great, and that was really helpful, and that profoundly impacted the people that you were focused on." I'm gonna go try something slightly different, right? But then they also see, but that, and that's my point about like it doesn't have to be in the office versus out of the office. You know what else happened? She saw that we all celebrated that as other leaders in the company. Caroline, that was great. We reinforced mm-hmm. that. We celebrated it. We highlighted it. We made it a thing. So we participated. Those aren't things that have to happen when you're in the office. Now, as a person who's very much in a face-to-face business, who sat at home for 13 months and then is now back on the road getting in front of people, there are things that are lost from being in person. The trade-offs are ones that you have to weigh and be intentional about, right? And then you have to find a way to solve those problems. Like, think about all, you know, uh, if you want a cultural environment where folks are, um, you know, are able to sort of just like serendipitously bring things up to each other, you can create that. If you want an opportunity for people to get to know each other and feel sticky that way, think about all the money you're going to save from having less office space if you, you know, once you start to mm-hmm. scale up as an organization, right? Fly everybody to Miami for a couple of days or whatever. I mean, maybe not Miami, but like, you know, because of the hurricane season. But, um, you know, certainly not Tallahassee. But, you know, take people, you know, do, there are lots of different ways to solve those problems. Again, but don't, you know, kind of as I talked about before, don't say, here's the current state problem, here's the ideal state, well, we can't get there. Well, what are all the steps along the way to get there and focus again in the right places to solve those problems as opposed to, solve, you know, focusing on the most obvious ones yeah. um, that are sort of the, the symptoms, if you will, not the underlying disease. Right. Well, that makes sense. And that's our show. Have a question for Ryan or Steven? Leave a comment. We'll be sure to get back to them. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching Consulting Logistics. I'm Kyle McNaught. Rock and roll.